You ever felt like the wind and the waves are building against your boat? Do we flow with the storms of life? Is your faith in the what or in the who? And revealing yourself to us. And we pray this morning that as we open your word, that you would open our hearts, that we could see more of you, we ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to uh, turn in your Bibles firstly to Luke chapter 8, and then we will finish in Daniel chapter 3 this morning. I want to talk a little bit about the start of 2018. And I want to, if I had a title for this morning's message, it would be Asleep in the Boat. And we'll, we'll have a look at that. But there's a passage in, in Luke chapter 8, basically, where uh, the, the disciples hit a storm and Jesus is asleep in the boat. And I found that to be amazing. I've been in some pretty rough weather in boats and I don't anticipate doing that again. But uh, I, don't, I didn't like it. But Jesus is asleep in the boat and we'll have a look at what happens there. But I realised that for some of us, looking at the weather that's on that lake there would probably resemble some of our lives at times. Who here made some New Year's resolutions? Ah, oh, very wise. <laughs> very wise. Because let's face it, we've had that extra piece of pav, right? And we slept in when we were supposed to be going for a jog. Yeah. yeah, we've already slept in, we've already had the pav, and the truth of the matter is it's good to reflect, actually, to take the new year and to reflect on things that have happened in the past and to look forward to what may be in the future is a very blessed opportunity. But so often resolutions come and go, but I think God calls every one of us to have resolve. Put aside your resolutions and let's have some resolve. And we're going to look at three men that had resolve. And uh, we'll have a look at Luke chapter 8 and then we'll give it some flesh and blood in the lives of three men in the Old Testament. But who here has ever watched Dr. Phil? Yeah. Dr. Phil's okay. Dr. Phil's okay. He's got some good things to say. And you, you ever watch how he does something very cleverly in his TV shows. He will take the life of one person that is sitting in his TV studio and he will disassemble their lives in front of thousands, if not millions. And what he's actually doing is he's taking the case study that is sitting before him and he's preaching a sermon in some respects to millions. And that's exactly what God is doing in the lives of every person in the Bible. This is what I love about the Bible. Nothing is hidden. The Bible is full of adultery, it's full of lies, and it's full of sin. And it's full of God's grace. Have a look at David. David was a man who committed some pretty horrific sin, but would be called a man after God's own heart. And we see how God interacts in his life. So it is with us. It's like the people in the Bible... God's trying to communicate who he is through their lives, just like Dr. Phil does, but God does it a lot better. And it turns out God's trying to do that in our lives. To the people that you'll go to work with tomorrow, God's trying to preach a sermon to them about how graceful he is and about how awesome he is. But let's, let's begin by looking at Luke chapter 8. And we're going to have a look at faith and what faith really looks like and you have to promise to love me when we're finished because God commands it amen amen all right one day he got into a boat with his disciples highlight that first line because what's about to happen to these disciples that first line is the most important thing that actually happens to them in this whole narrative you can face many storms in life and the difference will be who is in your boat who it is that is in your boat will make all the difference in how your vessel holds that storm. It will make all the difference as to whether you get to the other side. I need to tell everybody in this room this morning, I need to make something abundantly clear. If you were told, come to Jesus and your life will be rosy, from then on you were told a lie. Whether you believe in Jesus or, or not, Storms will come against you. And I want to make one thing clear. Bad things happen to good people. 
bad things happen to good people. And when they happen, what should we do is the question that we're going to attempt to answer. But we cannot. Let's resolve in 2018, before we go any further, let's resolve one thing, to value the presence of Christ. Jesus wants us to know his presence, but we have to invite him. He, he won't dwell where he's not invited. He won't dwell where he's not honoured. But let us value the presence of Christ. And what does Jesus say to the, his disciples? He says, let us go across to the other side of the lake. He never said to his disciples, let's get halfway, get tipped out and drown. That's not what he said. And if you think that picture is an exaggeration, the Sea of Galilee could look like that at any moment. And storms would whip up without any warning on the Sea of Galilee. It was a, it was a treacherous place to earn your living. And most people in the first century didn't know how to swim. Although if you're in that, good luck swimming through it anyway. But that's exactly what it could look like. And Jesus says, let us go to the other side. And who here, because I'll raise my hand to this at times, who here has ever felt God telling you to do something and then you get halfway across and there's a storm? Hang on a second, God, what's going on here? Didn't you say we were going to the other side? What's the go with this storm? Ever felt like God's pushing you in a direction and then there's a storm? Jesus is in the business of laying storms. Let us go to the other side. You know, Paul in Acts chapter 19, he's, he tells all the brothers, he says, I must go to Jerusalem and I must go to Rome. And if you want to know what resolve looks like, Paul fleshes this out. Because in, in Acts chapter 19, he says, I must go to Jerusalem and Rome. And all the ones that he loved, all the beloved disciples that he, that he loved so dearly pleaded with him, you must not go. This could not be of God, my paraphrase. This could not be of God. How, how could you possibly think that? You'll be killed in Jerusalem, let alone Rome. And he says, no, God's called me to go to Rome. Do you know before he gets to Rome, his life will be threatened multiple times. He will be beaten. He will be shipwrecked spend almost 12 months on a remote island, but he will get to Rome. He will be imprisoned for a long time. That takes resolve. When God calls you to go to the other side, it takes resolve to get there. Jesus says, let us go to the other side. Let's read what happens. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep, and a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and they woke him and said, Master, Master, we are perishing. And have a listen, have a listen to their words. We are perishing. Master, Master, not Lord, Lord, for a start, but Master, Master, we are perishing. One of the wisest men that I've ever met said, faith is less about what you are believing for and it's all about who you believe in. We get wrapped up in what we're believing for so often when God calls us to place our trust in a person. Master, master, we are perishing. And here's why so often Jesus is in the business of laying storms. Because nobody comes to the feet of Christ in calm water. When things are going well and everything's plain sailing, so often it takes a storm to drive us to the feet of Christ. But we're going to have a look at three men that knew what it was to worship God in calm water or rough water. Here we're going to find the problem, the underlying problem. And he woke and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves and they ceased and there was calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? Now that sounds somewhat harsh, doesn't it? Where is your faith? Who... Who could place themselves in the position of the disciples and say, yeah, we would have stood up and rebuked the wind and the waves? Who would have honestly done that? None of us would have got up. No one, none of us would have even thought to get up and rebuke, rebuke the wind and the waves. So that can't be what Jesus is referencing here when he says, where is your faith? No, no, no. The problem was not that they re didn't rebuke the wind and the waves. The problem was they were unaware of who was in the boat. 
And we find that in the words that will follow when Jesus says, where is your faith? And they were afraid and they marvelled, saying to one another, who then is this? The more you know who's in the boat, friends, let me tell you, you will lay down and sleep next to him. Because I can guarantee you one thing, and we're going to, I'm going to point it out in a moment when we get to Daniel chapter 3. Nobody in this room is in charge of any outcomes. You are not in charge of what the outcomes will be. The storm will come and what that looks like and the duration of all of that and what happens to the boat, you are not in charge of the outcomes. God is. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 3 as we try to give this some flesh and bones of what this looks like. Let me give you a little bit of background and uh, Earl and Cheryl, if you end up in Lagana, you'll get some background on Daniel and Jeremiah and Ezekiel that's been going for eight years. I, I, I don't think Andrew's taking a breath, so good luck. Uh, but uh, one thing you'll begin to realise is the history behind Israel basically is they all end up in exile in Babylon. They're taken away from the temple, they're taken away from their city. But it happens in three waves, in three different events. And the first one, Daniel and his friends that we read about here, they're taken to exile in the first wave. In the second wave of exiles, Ezekiel is taken. And all of these guys are aware of the prophecies of Jeremiah. That's just a, a little bit of background. But imagine being the age of Daniel, who is at best 16, 17, maybe younger. And in Daniel chapter 1, we read a guy that says, read about a guy who says, you know what? I may be in this place. <laughs> I may be in Babylon and there may be no temple here and there may be no priesthood here, but I can still worship God. And exile was the most healthiest thing that ever happened to Israel because they learned to worship God no matter what their surroundings were. Daniel exemplifies this in, in chapter one when he says, you know what, I'm not going to partake of all the decadence of the king's table. You know what, I'm just going to have my vegetables. Silly boy, but <laughs> we all need our meat, amen? Amen. So we find three guys, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And what happens in chapter three is that Nebuchadnezzar raises this huge image. Our measurements would be nine feet wide and about 90 feet tall. If you were in Babylon, you would have seen this, this image that he, has, that he has raised up. And he has commanded everybody, listen, when the music plays, you will bow down and you will worship this image. And do you know, if you want to fast forward that to the 21st century, the enemy is still trying to place images that distract us. The Im they still want us to worship things that are away from God. They, they want to call Jesus something other than the Son of God. They want to call marriage something other than what God intended it to be. Everything to distract us away from the original manuscript. I don't care what vote came in some months ago, the text in my Bible never changed with the vote. But what we will see in these three guys, Nebuchadnezzar, make no mistakes about this, Nebuchadnezzar, history will point, he's a, he's a guy that actually existed in history. You can look it up for yourself. There's no doubt this guy is a historical figure, one of the most evil guys you could imagine. Point your finger on the global map right now to the most evil place on the earth you think, so far removed from God, pick a place that you would think God could never turn that place upside down. In Daniel's day, they would have pointed to Babylon, but yet he is the only king recorded, a pagan king that converts to God. And it's not a very pretty scenario how that happens. You can read in chapter four how that happens. But four men have a resolve. Four men have resolved within themselves. We're going to worship God no matter what that costs. And it's a decision you have to make before the storm comes. But four men will flip the most evil empire in the world upside down and its king will be converted. There are many towering images trying to take our attention. I want to digress for a moment because this happens a lot. 
what I'm about to describe right now. Verse 8 says, Therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. And can I tell you that sometimes unjust things happen to Christian people. Sometimes you are financially ripped off. Sometimes people accuse you falsely and everybody around them believes them. That happens. And I know some people are sitting here going, yeah, that's, that's me. And that can happen from family members. That can happen no matter what. Living for Jesus Christ will do exactly what happened for these three men. It will draw attention. You may be maliciously accused. You may suffer unjustly and unfairly. But as Chuck Swindoll says, faith is 10% what happens to us and 90% how we react. And when we look at these guys here, they knew they were not in control of the outcomes and we will leave everything up to God. Have a look how Daniel reacts in chapter 6 in the, in the lion's den. It doesn't say a word against those that accused him. And we have a look at three men in chapter 3 and they are maliciously accused and they never raise it. They never ask to be brought before the court of law and to have a trial. None of that. They leave all the outcomes in the hands of God. So that's verse 8. Coming down in chapter 3, we'll start at verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded, once he had learnt that these guys would not bow down, he commanded that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and he said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon harp, the bagpipe and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. And how many people here, and I will put my hat in the ring, how many people here would have said, you know what, it's just easier if we bow down and cross our fingers, pretend we didn't mean it, and just everything's rosy. We just go back to our life. How many people here would possibly even have had the thought in their minds, you know what, let's just do it and repent later. Resolve, when we live with resolve, it looks like I've already decided that I don't care what happens, I'm not going to make those decisions. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar had one reputation. He carried out what he said and he did it swiftly. This, these were not empty threats. But have a listen to the words of Nebuchadnezzar. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Oh, you should not have said that. <laughs> Read chapter 4. This man will spend a period of time. We don't know whether it's seven days, seven weeks, seven months or seven years. But it's a multiple of seven. And he will spend that period of time on all fours eating grass with a Jew on his back. But he will return. And when he does, he worships God. The book of Daniel, we think the book of Daniel is so often about, about visions and about prophecies, but you know what it's really about? It's about the gracious hand of God to intervene in the life of such an evil and pagan man. You know, God didn't have to give Nebuchadnezzar dreams that only Daniel would be able to give the interpretation for. You know, God doesn't have to intervene in the life of Nebuchadnezzar now and nobody would have blinked or asked a question if God had wiped him off the face of the earth. Nobody would have said, oh, where's he going? That was a bit unfair. All sin, no matter which one you name, will all be branches that are attached to the one tree and that is pride. Pride is the enemy of God. Proverbs chapter 16 makes it clear, I've said this before, God will tear down the house of the proud. God tears down Nebuchadnezzar's house. God will tear down your house to remove pride. Who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? I love their answer. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Not only do they have no need to answer, we don't have any need to grovel. We're not going to beg for our life. 
We don't care what people have said about us because we've already resolved what we're going to do. We have no need to answer you in this matter because we're guilty. <laughs> we're not going to bow down to whatever it is that you set up. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us out of the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O King. I want everybody to know that. Take encouragement from that verse this morning. God is able. Get excited. You're not going to like the next three words, but get excited at the fact that God is able. God is able to rescue you from anything. God is able to overcome whatever financial difficulties you find yourself in right now. God is able to heal whatever infirmity. God is able to, God could if he wanted to, by the end of next week if he wanted to, he could sweep this city and save souls en masse and it would have nothing to do with us and it would be all about him and he is able to do that. Whatever storm you're facing, God is able to see you to the other side. But I've got a question for you this morning. And it stems from the next three words. But if not... Oh, some buts we like, Terry. I'm not sure that everybody likes this one. But if not, be it known to you, O King, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. But if not, whatever happens in this storm, I'm not in control of the outcomes. So if not, we're still not going to bow down. And the question I want to ask everybody here today is, do the circumstances that surround you dictate whether or not you worship God? Because these guys said, you know what, we're going to worship God no matter what. And we can't pass this off as just an Old Testament Theology, because why? Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prayed exactly these words in a sense. He says, you, O God, can take this cup away from me. But your will be done. You see, God prepares some of the furnaces. Look, all of us face furnaces in our lives. All of us face storms. And, and some of the furnaces that we face, the enemy absolutely prepares for us. Read the story of Job. In some of the furnaces, we prepare ourselves. In some of the furnaces, God prepares. And make no mistake, because the disciples were of complete conviction that God had prepared Christ's furnace. In Acts chapter 4, when they are praying, they say, You, O God, who prepared the high priest and Pontius Pilate at just the right time. Following Christ looks like we may have to walk through furnaces as well. And I want to ask you this morning, so often God is able, but we want the outcomes to be our way. You know what, God, I'm happy to go through the storms, but you've got five minutes to end this, and I want it to look like this. Friends, none of us are in charge of that. And faith is not necessarily being able to stop the wind and the waves. Faith is being able to lay down next to Christ in the boat and say, whatever happens, I know it'll be for the best. Amen. And Nebuchadnezzar is enraged at these guys. And verse 23 says, And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, fell bound into the burning fiery furnace. Oh, well, that just flips everything right on its head. Hang on a second. I had it all worked out. I, I, I had the mathematical formula worked out. Before, before I read this chapter, I had the mathematical formula worked out. It's this simple, right? All you've got to do is be a good person, build up some brownie points, and if you, if you pray for three quarters of an hour and if you read a certain amount of chapters of the Bible every day, then you can ask whatever you want... And God will give it to you. Turns out, I haven't been able to find that yet. And when we get to John chapter 15 and it says, ask whatever you wish, it'll be interesting how abiding in Christ will change your wish list.
And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, fell bound in the burning fiery furnace. And can I tell you that 2,000 years ago, the Son of God hung upon a cross. The same man that said, I could call 12 legions of angels right now and do away with this. The same man that said, you'd have no power over me if my father had not given it to you. It would be the same man that said, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down. The same man, the the most important thing to Jesus was the relationship and the connection with the Father. And he lost that on the cross momentarily. He He will cry from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he did that so that he was separate from God so that we don't have to be. Let's keep reading because there's some good news coming. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste and he declared to his counsellors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and they said to the king, true, O king. And he answered, he said, but I see four men unbound. Oh. Walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar sees four men walking unbound. If you read the rest of the chapter, you'll realise that these guys are taken out of the fiery furnace and their hair is not singed. They don't even have the smell of fire on them. The only thing that has suffered any harm in the fire is what it was that bound them in the first place. And I've got some good news for you this morning. And the good news is no matter what your furnace looks like, no matter what your boat and the storm looks like, I want you to know that there is somebody in that boat and there is somebody in that furnace that wants to take you to the other side. Whatever that looks like. Faith looks like I've had no control over the outcomes, but I can control who I'm focused on. Coming to know who it is that is in our boat means another thing as well. We will begin to realise who we are. The more we get to know who he is, the more we get to know who we are. The more we see him for who he is, the more we see us for who we are. We sang some words from Isaiah chapter 6. And Isaiah was a great prophet already. He was a man that obeyed God and lived for God. And we see in Isaiah chapter 6 that he sees God in the temple. You know, he sees Jesus and the train of his robe fills the temple. And his reaction is the same as everybody else's. He falls down like a dead man. John spends three years in the presence of Christ. And in the book of Revelation, when he sees Jesus in all his glory, he falls down like a dead man. When you come, the more you come to the reality of the presence of Christ, the more you will realise how sinful we really are. One preacher said, you know what? If sin were blue, we'd all be Smurfs. (laughs) John Calvin taught about a, a topic called total depravity. People have construed that to mean a lot of things that it probably doesn't mean. So many people think it it means the measurement and the depth of our sin. That's not what it means. It means the extent, the extent of our sin. We are so blue. Why? Because now we, sin has infiltrated the way we view God. Sin has infiltrated the way we view the world. Sin has infiltrated the way we view everybody else. And what is becoming more and more particularly disturbing is sin has infiltrated the way we view ourselves. The extent of sin, all of our desires. And Jesus has come to rub the blue out. And it's only Christ that can do that. It's only Christ that can do that. As I bring this to a close this morning, I want to ask you, is your faith in the what or in the who? Is your faith in the what or in the who? And let us resolve in 2018 to get to know the who, of who it is that is in our boat. 
If that means you've got to get up half an hour earlier in the morning, then please get up half an hour early in the morning. If that means that you need to buy yourself a journal so that you can allow God to speak to you through his word, then buy yourself a journal. If that means you need to link up with a life group, whatever you have to do, do it. What is stopping you? We see in the person of Jesus Christ that God has reached his arms out as far as he possibly can. And he's waiting for us. Second question is, do circumstances dictate your worship? Do we flow with the storms of life or do we worship God no matter the storms of life? And lastly, as we approach 2018, I want to ask you what your resolve is for this year. We make many resolutions trying to improve ourselves and and that's fine as well. We make many resolutions trying to improve ourselves or trying to improve things around us and and, and that's okay. But the difference in 2019 will be what we have resolved to do in 2018. Let us resolve to get to know God. Let us resolve to worship him no matter the circumstances, because God just may be preaching a sermon through you to somebody that you're completely unaware of. There's people I know, and there's people in this church that I know people would look at and say, you know what, I see four men in your furnace. (laughs) I see something different. 